Shepherd Podcast. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Pastor Jay, and I uh, wanted to do something a little bit different this week. And uh, I've had a number of people, uh, both in my church and then uh, you know some friends outside the church, kind of ask, what is going on with the Southern Baptist Convention? What is all this infighting that we're hearing about? This was a very contentious, it seemed like, um, annual meeting that took place back in the summer. And uh, my, my father-in-law actually went to that uh, and had sort of a different take as well. I might talk about it a little bit later, but there's been a number of issues and some, you know, just borderline and even outright scandals that, that have kind of taken place uh, in the last few months in the Southern Baptist Convention. And so it just kind of begs the question, what is going on with the Southern Baptist Convention? And is this a problem that the general church needs to be concerned about? And so I kind of wanted to just touch upon five issues that have come up uh, over the last couple of years uh, within the Southern Baptist Convention and kind of just give you my personal opinion and take on that, you know, personal opinion, take it or leave it. Um, I am, you know, pretty conservative in my theology, pretty conservative in my politics, pretty conservative in how I think the Southern Baptist Convention should run. However, I am not super conservative. Uh, and so... There, there's a whole branch that's called, they've even started their own sort of, uh, I don't know, watchdog network called the the uh, Conservative Baptist Network. And uh, they're way a little more uh, <laughs> militant about it than I am uh, about conservatism, but then they're trying to fight what they call the liberal drift uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention. And of course, anybody that knows the history of the SBC knows that back in you know the late '80s, early '90s, you had a you know what they call the conservative resurgence, or as the opponents called it, the fundamentalist takeover of the SBC. Uh, it was really sort of uh, sparked off because of some of the liberal teachings that were going on in the seminaries, particularly Southern Seminary um, in, in Kentucky, and um, you know that that led to a fight where conservatives kind of retook. Uh, in their view, the, the Southern Baptist Convention, and then once they had a, a series of presidents that were conservative presidents, they then elected the committee on committees that then filtered down to where you were making sure you had conservatives in place, uh, both within the convention itself and within the seminaries to, to kind of stem the tide of that liberal drift that was going on. Well, now you've got a number of these uh, conservatives that are coming out and saying, well, we're facing that same sort of problem with some of the teachings of critical race theory and wokeness and things that are coming in and some of the liberal drift and tendencies that are happening in the convention and in the seminaries again. And so they're, they're trying to, to fight that sort of battle again uh, is how they portray that. And so I kind of want to give you my opinion on these things and um, kind of just really just kind of give an explanation of, at least as far as I understand it, um, so I'll give a disclaimer to begin with. I am by far uh, from an active participant in the Southern Baptist Convention. I, I don't hold any offices. I've never served on any committees beyond the local level uh, in, in associational work. I've never even done anything for the state convention, uh, the BGCO, the Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma. And so, um, and even though I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, to be honest, it was not until I was serving as a pastor uh, in a Southern Baptist church when I first started getting involved in associational work and understanding what was going on with the SBC and what, what that meant and what the cooperative program was and all of those things. And so, um, you know, I, I'm far from a, a diehard, lifelong SBC proponent. Um, I also quite frankly, just don't care that much about some of the politics and some of the infighting that's going on in the SBC. Um, I've listened to a number of, of conservative podcasts or videos and, and things that are trying to, trying to talk about some of these things. And uh, I agree in part with some of them and that I think they go way too far in some other things. And so I'm, I'm sort of kind of wavering, you know, more conservative side, but not not fully conservative, at least as far as the, the some of those proponents would say. And so that's kind of where I'm sitting. Um, you've got those on the left that say, hey, we need to, to move this far and need to go further and do these things uh, to really advance the gospel and to, and to fulfill our call as the Southern Baptist Convention. You've got the conservatives that say, you know, the, 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 the doomsayers that are saying the Southern Baptist Convention is collapsing on itself and we're about to just be destroyed and, and, all, and judged by God and all these things. And I'm, I'm in e neither of those camps. And, uh, and quite frankly, for the most part, I don't really care 
um, which is a problem in itself, which I'll get to at the very end. But uh, So I wanted to talk about the, I've got five issues that have risen in, in, over the course of the last several years in the SBC that have sort of all come to a head this year and why there has been so much dissension in this annual meeting and, uh, uh, and why there's so much talk going on 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 the radios and on the the podcasts and whatnot about all of this stuff and so the first and the probably the biggest one and the most recent one is a uh, wokeness uh entering into first the seminaries and then the southern baptist convention as a whole uh, and particularly when it is um related to uh crt or critical race theory now all of this came about you know back in 2020 with the uh the uh the uh, uh, killing of George Floyd and the riots and the race things that that kind of sparked off and that, that renewed interest in this original, what originally was a legal theory, critical race theory, um, that then started to uh, you know, be a, a major uh, factor in the Black Lives Matters movement and the things. And so and then you started having professors that were saying, see, this is what we're talking about, that have been teaching in, in more liberal uh, colleges and things for years. Uh, we're bringing this out to the forefront. And that's really kind of how it started. And then, uh, but then it started seeping into the churches. And, uh, and I'll be the, I, I will admit, I actually, a couple of weeks after the George Floyd incident, um, I had been listening to a lot of sermons. I was, I mean, like many people in the country, I was, you know, moved in my heart about racism and about, you know, the, you know, love for our brothers and sisters of different ethnicities and things like that. And so I wanted to make a statement about racism and uh, especially given the Southern Baptist history, of course, the Southern Baptist Convention was founded over the issue of racism and, and slavery. Um, it, you know, they, they broke off from the other Baptists because they wanted to have slaves and they, they saw no problem with that. And so um, the Southern Baptist Convention has that in its history. Now, I do not agree that we should have to continually, like day after day, continually apologize for that. The Southern Baptist Convention has apologized for that numerous, numerous times. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we necessarily give up the fight about fighting for uh, racial justice and, and equality and things like that. Um, but so I was moved by these things and I was listening to um, some sermons that were being done uh, by people like Matt Chandler, J.D. Greer, David Platt, who are, you know, some big name people in the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, at the time, I believe David Platt, well, no, I think he was still the, the director of the IMD at that point. Um, you know, and so, you know, these were big, influential, big name preachers that, that a lot of people listen to, mega church preachers. And so I'm listening to some of their sermons and I was really moved by them. And I really got caught up in researching, um, you know, racial inequality and um, where you get the, the white guilt and the, uh, the white privilege and all, all of these different kinds of things. And so I, and I, <laughs> I told my congregation after I really went down like the rabbit hole. I went like way into all of this stuff. And I got up on a Sunday morning, a couple weeks after this George Floyd incident, and I preached, and I say preached, I spoke um, this message that was probably the most woke, you know, uh, critical race theory, positive, you know, white guilt, white privilege, you know, affirming kind of a, a message that anybody has ever heard. And, yeah, it was bad, <laughs> and uh, um, it it, uh, it it to this day, and probably, hopefully, I hope always will be the only sermon that I have or message that I have ever preached that I completely regret, um, because I, I got so caught up in all of that nonsense, and that's what it is. It's nonsense, and. Um, <clears throat> I fortunately had the opportunity a year, almost a year later, uh, when I spoke again on racism and completely refuted critical race theory and all of its tenets, um, you know, while still affirming that we have work to do and things like that. And so it was a much better biblically based uh, sermon because you, you actually use the Bible for it at that time, you know. And, and so that's why I said the other one was a, more of a message and not a sermon. And so I, I myself have been caught up in the fervor and the media spirit scope and the, and the, uh, the, the nonsense. And so I say that, I tell you all this to say I have come from that perspective. And, and so I understand 
coming from that perspective of what that looks like. And so, but having stepped back and having you know, really evaluated, gotten over the emotionalism of the moment, gotten over the like, you know, the passion and the, the loud raised voices and really dug into the history of critical race theory, dug into what they actually believe, really looked into the Black Lives Matters movement. Uh, now, you know, I, I like most people would affirm the statement that yes, Black Lives Matters and, and I'm not going to get into the debate about Black Lives Matters versus All Lives Matters. I mean, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm saying, but the Black Lives Matters movement, the actual organization, is not a Christian godly organization. They affirm completely opposite standards that the Bible would affirm. And so Christians cannot support the Black Lives Matters movement. They can't because they are pro-abortion. They are pro-gay marriage. They are pro-transgender rights. They are pro all these things that Christians cannot affirm. And so you can say the same, yes, I believe Black Lives Matter, but you cannot support that organization. So I dug into all of those things, I dug into the history of critical race theory, and I was able to present a much more uh, balanced view this time of the problems of critical race theory and what that means. And uh, just in a nutshell, I don't want to take all the time, maybe I'll do a whole other podcast on that sometime about the problems with uh, critical race theory. The, the main problems are that it's, number one, not biblically based, and it's all about flipping the script. And um, I don't think most people that are affirming it get that. It's not just about making um, all you know, racial uh, injustices, making everything equal. It's about flipping the script. So whites essentially have had power for all these years. Now we want to put whites down in that position of, of minority and put the, the, the minorities over them. And so that now that, because that that would be fair because they were oppressed for so many years and now the whites are going to be oppressed. And so that's that's really in a nutshell what what critical race theory is looking to do. Um, And, you know, I've had people say, well, there there are certain aspects of it that are valuable. I'm like, okay, well, there might be, but you can't get beyond the basic principles that they're trying to espouse. And so, you know, even if there might be some nuggets of truth within the, the theory of critical race theory, there's not, you know, the, those nuggets of truth are not going to negate the fact that the, the end game is going to completely overthrow um, the, the, uh, the system of the way things do. And it's about revolution. It's not about harmony, which is not a Christian principle. And so, you know, critical race theory is completely incompatible, incompatible with Christianity and with biblical principles. It just is. Now, that doesn't mean that there is no such thing as racism. Yes, there is absolutely racism. I would even go so far as to say, and even though many conservative Baptists would say there is not such a thing as, as a systemic racism, I do believe there is systemic racism in our country. Uh, however, I would say most of those things are legacy systems in that they were laws that were on the books years ago during the civil rights era and Jim Crow laws and things like that. Um, and the consequences of those things that took place years and years ago, unfortunately, are still being carried out. Um, I think there's some severe problems in our criminal justice system. Um, and I think there are issues there. And I think that's demonstrably true. Uh, that there is racism going on in various places. Now, does that mean every time a, a white police officer shoots a black person that that's, a, that that's racism? No, absolutely not. Um, but there are reasons why, you know, there's more crime in urban areas. There's reasons why there are more crimes in ghettos, as they're called, because some of those urban housing initiatives were racist in the beginning, years and years and years ago, that have led to poverty and have led to, have led to desperation and have led to uh, gains and things like that. And, so, and that's why it's systemic. That's what it means it, it touches everything. And so, yeah, there, there are systems in place still, or at least legacies of systems that originally were in place that are racist. And so we do need to be aware of those things and how to fix them. Uh, because it's not going to be an easy fix, and, and critical race theory is not going to fix that. All critical race theory is doing is stirring the pot and making racism even worse. <laughs> it really is, because I mean, all you have to do is look around. Um, you know, you've got people saying ridiculous things like, you know, things haven't gotten any better than you know, it was under slavery or under Jim Crow laws. Well, that's ridiculous. Of course, it's better. 
Of course it's better. It's ridiculous to say stupid things like that, but people are buying into these things. Anyway, bringing it back to the point, all of these kind of principles have crept into the seminaries and some of the teachings that are being done there um, and some of the professors that are teaching these things, and it's crept into some of the, the, the bigger named leaders, as some of the ones I've talked about before, that are preaching and teaching these kinds of things. Now, I'm all for racial reconciliation. I'm all for equality. I'm all for uh, you know, fighting and combating racism at every possible level, but this is not the right way. It needs to be based on the Bible. It needs to be, you know, don't show partiality because God doesn't show partiality. That goes both ways. We don't show partiality, you know, with I'm going to hire a minority, you know, regardless of whether they're the best person for the job, just because I want to show that I hire minorities. Well, that's that's not right either. Uh, it's got it's got to be, you know, not showing partiality. That's the biblical perspective. And so um, all of these things have caused a lot of problems within the convention and are still being fought over. Um, they made a resolution, I think it was Resolution 9 a couple of years ago, where they, and resolutions are, you know, basically statements that say, hey, we are focusing on this particular aspect and, and we're resolving to, you know, to do this, or we resolve that, that racism is bad, or we resolve that abortion is bad, and, and that those kind of things. Well, back in 2019, they made a resolution that critical race theory and intersection ability, which is a whole other thing, um, are useful tools, I believe is the word, useful tools for evaluating the current racial crisis uh, in addition to and subject, subject to the Bible. They did include that in there. Uh, but that brought in outside philosophies, and it is a philosophy. It's not a tool, it's a philosophy. Uh, and it's based in Marxism and communism, interestingly enough, if you get into the history of it. And so, you know, it brought that in and that caused a lot of issues. And then of course, COVID hit in 2020 and they didn't, they didn't really have the, the, the national convention. And so uh, it carried over and it really came to a head this last year. And so there, there were statements to like completely remove that statement. And I don't, I don't know that we've ever had a time where we had a resolution to remove a previous resolution, but I, I think that's kind of what happened or tried to happen. And so it's, it's been a, a major issue there. And so the, the liberalism and the wokeness that is, that is coming into the seminaries and the convention is primarily based on that. But with intersectionability, that's connecting in issues about transgender rights and gay marriage and gay rights and uh, things like that. And, and whereas I, I've not, I mean, you do have those pastors in those churches that have said, hey, we're going to be gay affirming. Uh, meaning that we accept uh, gays openly practicing homosexuals into our congregation and welcome them with loving arms and say everything's cool and you don't have to worry about that. Um, that's what I mean by affirming churches. And you do have, you've had those that have left the convention or have been kicked out of the convention because of those things. But even those that are still within the convention, you get those that are saying, hey, it's okay, you know, to a certain extent and things like that. And, and, and I'll admit it's a fine line to walk because you want to be loving. You don't want to be judgmental but at the same time you can't affirm the sin and uh and so there's there's issues with that and so all of this is like tied in with the, the liberal drift and the wokeness and whatnot that have gone into the seminaries and then filtered into the southern baptist convention as a whole at least from the, the leadership hierarchy on down uh, the second issue that's really come into uh, and it came right out of the the uh the con the uh, convention that took place back in the summer um the I would have probably called him a more moderate uh, choice, uh, but he's considered liberal in the conservative circles. But uh, the the moderate or liberal uh, candidate of Ed Litton was elected as uh, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and uh, he uh, he you know he was big for racial reconciliation. He's worked to do that in his church, I believe, it's in Alabama, uh, and, and things like that. And so that was part of the reason for for his. And he had a lot of backing from some of the African American pastors and things like that. And so that was part of the reason for his winning, even though it was a very close election against, uh, I believe, it was Mike Stone, who was from the Conservative Baptist Network and the more ultra conservative uh, sort of candidate. And I think I think it was like within 300 votes that Ed Litton got elected. Well, within. I mean, just a week or two of him being elected president, there this huge scandal came out that he plagiarized J.D. Greer's uh, sermons on Romans. And there were YouTube videos where they actually compared, I mean, like word for word illustrations, word for word points that he's making. I mean, not just taking the outline, like literally preaching almost the exact same sermon. And, um, and so 
And the reason it was such a scandal, is, in my mind, is because at first, Ed Litton denied that anything had happened that was wrong. Um, you know, he said, hey, J.D. gave me permission to use, his, to use his outline, and we do that from time to time. We felt like this was saying what we wanted to, to say, and so I don't have anything to apologize for. And um, personally, I think that's false. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's one thing to take an outline. I mean, I use, I've used other sermon you know, outlines or other pastors' outlines that I've heard, or I've been to a conference and I heard a sermon. I was like, hey, this is great. I like these points, and I would write the points down. But just because I write the outline down or the points down means doesn't mean that I am literally taking word for word the illustrations of what you're saying because I have to craft it in my own personality, in my own way, and to gear it towards my own congregation. Um, if I just read a sermon that I printed off online, I mean that's, I mean that well it's plagiarism. Uh, in any institution, you know, college, seminary, or whatever, it's plagiarism, plain and simple. And you would you would get kicked out of school, or at least very least get an F for the class for that sort of thing. Um, and so you know what made it such a big controversy, at least in my mind, is that Ed Litton denied it for so long, and then finally, I want to say after like a month. He says, you know what, I'm sorry this happened. Even though he, he didn't really apologize for it, but he's saying, I'm sorry that this, you know, you know, I'm sorry that this happened and we're gonna move on now. And so it's really kind of died down now. Uh, but he still really didn't apologize because he doesn't really see it as being a problem. Uh, because he says, Well, I got permission. And he says, Well, all all pastors plagiarize. Well, sure, like I said, we're all getting information from all the same sources and we listen to podcasts and we listen to sermons all the time and so yeah sure some of those things are influencing us but most pastors are not getting up in the pulpit every sunday and literally reading a script from someone else's sermon which is kind of how this came out because it was more than one sermon it was like the entire roman series uh, and then they you know even more came out it was like in the book of Acts, you know, the series he did on Acts, it was like basically copied, pasted from uh, J.D. Greer's. Um, and then, then even more controversy on top of that, the, the videos from, the, from that church's website got taken down for scheduled maintenance. So then it was like, okay, well. And so that, that was a big controversy. And that's led to a lot of issues and a lot of people just getting really disillusioned with, with the, the way things are going in, in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, tying into that, part of the reason why Ed Litton was elected too is because he was going to be an advocate for the sex abuse victims within the Southern Baptist Convention, and he wanted to have an independent commission that was going to investigate the executive committee and their culpability within uh, covering up sex abuse scandals. Now, I will admit, I don't actually know where they're coming from with a lot of this. I haven't, I, I mean, I know there have been a number of controversies and scandals. Uh, and sex abuse issues that have happened in Southern Baptist churches over the last several years. You've had situations where, you know, a youth minister molested a teenage girl when he was a youth minister, and then it got covered up, and he went on and, and became a pastor at another church in Tennessee over here, and things like that. Um, but, and, and I guess, it really, I honestly think it has to do with people just don't understand how the Southern Baptist Convention works. Uh, because I'm not sure what they think the executive committee or the Southern Baptist Convention as a whole is supposed to do about those issues. Uh, the churches, in the, I mean, churches, the, the SBC is not a hierarchy. And, you know, the president of the SBC is not the pope over the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, the, the individual churches have autonomy and independence, and we voluntarily associate with this association. But, you know, the president of the SBC doesn't tell me Jack Gidley, you know, the, the the uh, even my local director of missions is here exists to serve me and serve the church they don't tell me what to do and how to do things and so really the responsibility lies on the individual churches that were involved um but then there was this uh this release letter from uh, russell moore that, that's you know are these release tapes or things like that which russell moore we we'll get to in a minute um which led to some controversy and some questions about does the ERLC, the, or not the, ER, the uh, executive committee, actually care about the sex abuse victims and things like that because a statement taken out of context, I believe by Ronnie Floyd, made it sound like they didn't. And so that led to this huge um, anger and, and frustration. And uh, that all once again came to head at the Southern Baptist Convention. And um, they actually voted to do this independent commission uh, to, to investigate 
the uh, executive committee, which is made, I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, pastors of churches and deacons and things like that. We're not talking about like elected or even paid officials. I mean, these are guys that volunteer their time. They get a stipend to travel to wherever they have to go in Tennessee, probably to, you know, to the national convention to have these meetings. But I mean, that's really all they get paid. Um, and then you've got guys that just came in, you know, this year that are like stepping into this mess. I don't, I mean, I, I would hate to be one in their shoes. But they voted at the convention to actually waive attorney-client privilege, um, which has led to a number of issues, including the law firm that has represented the Southern Baptist Convention for something like 50 or 60 years has now dissolved ties with us, says we can't, we can't work like this, we can't function like this. Uh, and you've had Ronnie Floyd and as the president, the vice president, and about half of the, of the executive committee have all resigned uh, in protest and honestly in fear of getting you know, personal lawsuits against them because of this stuff. Uh, and like I said, I really feel like it all just stems from a misunderstanding of how this works uh, because the Southern Baptist Convention as an entity is not a hierarchical structure over the local churches. It doesn't work that way. It's the opposite. They exist to serve and to work for the, the local church. Um, and I think that maybe even the, 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 uh, the upper level executives maybe have misunderstood that point because they've, they've said it's some statements that seem to say that to the contrary. Um, number four, kind of leading into that, part of, like I said, part of this stemmed off from, a, from an open letter that Russell Moore, who was the president of the uh, ERLC, the Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission, which is a branch of the Southern Baptist Convention, that focused really on uh, legal battles uh, and promoting religious liberty uh, in, the, in the courts and, and in the country. Uh, and Russell Moore resigned sort of in protest of what he saw as some problems within the convention, uh, particularly some of the, the upper elites um, support of Donald Trump uh, and, and, you know, forgetting his policies, but despite the fact that he was, you know, a sinful, horrible person. Uh, and said some really terrible, horrible things. And, and yes, he did some great things for Christianity. He did some great things for the churches. He he uh, uh, he definitely was, in a lot of ways, the most pro-life, uh, at least actively pro-life president that we have ever had. And as far as the policies that he tried to enact, um, however, that does not negate the things that he said and did. Um, and there are a lot of questions in my mind personally whether that man is actually a Christian or not. Uh, and I lean towards no, uh, a definitive no, actually, not, not even, I don't even have a whole lot of question about it, to be honest. Um, and so with that in mind, the Southern Baptist leaders, some of the, the main preachers and, and uh, big church preachers and things like that, they were so adamant in supporting him and getting involved in political stomping for him. Uh, really was kind of head scratching for me because I was like, okay, look, I mean, yes, I agree with his policies. I agree with the conservative positions that he is taking. I'll hold my nose in both for him, but I'm not going to advocate and say this is the greatest president ever, you know, or this is the savior of the of America. No, um, I mean, there there were people, you know, that, that there were pictures of Jesus wearing a "Make America Great Again" hat. I'm mean, just like that makes me cringe. And certainly all the, the uh, active, you know, politicking from, from members of the Southern Baptist Church has, has unfortunately hitched our wagon to a very polarizing figure. Uh, and I think it's honestly, it's hurt our cause because how can you lovingly witness to someone and try to share the gospel with them? And they'll be like, oh, wait, you, you pulled for this guy and said that he was the greatest president ever and yet look at all these terrible things he said and did you're a hypocrite and they're probably right uh but anyway that's neither here nor there but, but russell moore you know kind of called that out and he got kind of lambasted for that uh which i did agree with him for the most part like i said as i've said some of these things about donald trump but then there were some questions about how he was running uh the ethics and religious liberties commission there was a, a mosque that was trying to be built in in new jersey and the er the erlc actually promoted and tried to help them get uh this mosque built uh in new jersey and a lot of people cried out and said hey why are we helping muslims get mosque built that seems antithetical to the gospel uh, which I was like, from this, you know, from a objective standpoint, I'm like, okay, well, if we're promoting religious liberty, then we're promoting religious liberty for all religions, 
uh, then I get that. And that, that really is sort of their, their calling and what they're supposed to do. Now, you could ask the question as to whether we should have that sort of thing, if it's going to be doing those sorts of things. But that really is part of what they do. It's religious liberty for everybody, not just for Christians. Um, I would have more of a problem with it if you had the International Mission Board that was promoting that. I mean, obviously, that's not their job. That's not their calling. Um, so I didn't personally have that big of an issue with it and, and as far as it relates to their actual job of what they're doing. I do question whether we even need the ERLC and what its purpose is, but that's a story for another time. So all of these kind of controversies led into to some of these things as well. And then uh, the last thing I want to bring up, the fifth thing, uh, you had um, Randy Adams, uh, I believe out in Northern California, uh, the director of missions out there in that region uh, came out uh, as one of the presidential candidates, and he was he was eliminated pretty early. He only got so many votes. Uh, and he was the fourth out out of four uh, candidates that wasn't really even in the running. But he came out with some very polarizing sort of lightning rod kind of statements about the mismanagement of IMB and North American Mission Board finances. Um, and the, uh, the, the mishandling of the money and the cooperative program dollars that your local churches are putting in there. Um, and he had proof. Uh, he brought out some of these things. And um, unfortunately, he brought, you know, he brought like, uh, uh, my father-in-law actually talked about this. They brought like bulletins, I mean like pamphlets and, and uh, brochures and things that are actually talked about all these things. And it really, it really kind of irritated people. And I think that's probably why he got even less votes than he might have gotten otherwise. But um but I mean, some of the statements that you're saying are, are actually verifiable, truthful statements. And so that, that led to a number of questions about, okay, you've got millions upon millions upon millions of dollars going through the Southern Baptist Convention to your seminaries, to your International Mission Board, your North American Mission Board, you know, to all these different entities and things like that. Why, you know, <laughs> and then there's, there's some levels where there's not a whole lot of accountability. Um, there are some questions about some of your your uh, executives, some of your higher up leaders, and what is their salary? For example, what is the salary of the Southern Baptist president? We don't know. It's not disclosed, and that's a problem. It really should be. I mean, my church knows exactly how much they pay me. It would be weird if I said, oh, yeah, you don't get to know how much you pay me. And so that kind of brings up a question. Is like, well, what? <laughs> Should we be concerned about that? And and uh, and so there there are questions about some of those things that that you know the the money mismanagement and things like that that have actually caused some controversy as well. So to summarize all of these things, all of these things, like I said, really kind of came to head this summer at the at the national convention level. So to back it back out and kind of give a summary and an overall perspective on this, what is the state of the Southern Baptist Convention as of 2021 as we're getting ready to go into 2022? Um, you know, I've had people ask me, is it time to leave the Southern Baptist Convention? Um, I actually, I actually may put some links in, in I, I, at least one link in the, in the description below of um, uh, a podcast called Conversations That Matter, where he actually gave eight reasons why you should leave the Southern Baptist Convention right now. Um, and for the most part, I can't argue with a lot of them, honestly. Um, my answer to them that have asked that of me is, I'm not there yet. And I say yet because, uh, you know, there are a lot of problems with the SBC. Um, but there have always been a lot of problems with the SBC. I mean, it's a human organization made up of human people that make mistakes, that are you know, susceptible to greed, that are susceptible to arrogance and pride, that are susceptible to, to human frailties. And so, you know, there's always going to be, you're never going to find an organization or a structural you know, institution that is going to be perfect. You're never going to find that this side of heaven. Uh, and so, you know, you have to give some grace in that regard. Um, you know, there's no perfect church, big or small. Um, you know, there's no perfect pastor, you know, great or small, mega church or small church pastor. And so, you know, and all of these organizations are made up of people that are fallible. And the more people you get, the more opinions of how things should be done you're going to get. And it just multiplies exponentially. And so, you know, there's a lot of issues, yes, but I think there's a lot of good that the Southern Baptist Convention does do. Now, that being said, the biggest problem I have, honestly, with the Southern Baptist Convention is not really most of these issues here, except maybe the last one that I'll talk about. 
Um, but you know, I'm not super concerned about liberal drift. I'm not super concerned about all of these things because as it did before, I think eventually they'll balance back out. And if it doesn't, then it's not going to affect the local church that much because local churches that are paying attention will withdraw from the Southern Baptist Convention as many have. Um, and so, and if it gets to that point where we're starting to teach things like, you know, we're having that controversy in the Methodist church, for example, where we start saying, hey, gay marriage is okay, then this church will be pulling out of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and so we keep an eye on that thing, those things. And then, you know, if it gets to that point, then yeah, then, then it's going to dissolve and that'll be the end of it. But um, I'm not super concerned about some of those things right now. Um, what does concern me and, and what I have seen on a personal level uh, is the mismanagement of the funds, the mismanagement, not just of the finances, but also of how things like the cooperative program work, how the International Mission Board selects missionaries to go where, uh, what criterion they use. Those things actually bother me more than some of these other issues. Um, you know, if I'm called by God to be a missionary in some small tribal village in Africa, and I really have received that specific of a vision about I, I'm supposed to go here, and I go through the training, I go to seminary, I get the training that I'm supposed to do, and I go to the International Mission Board and say, hey, I'm supposed to go here, and they say, nah, we don't have anything in place there, we're going to send you to China. That's not biblical, and that's not spiritual at all. I mean, that's... That's ridiculous, and it's a way, and quite frankly, it's a waste of money to send that person to China because that's not where they're supposed to go. Um, I think there's also a, an institutional problem with it all being so big um, that there's no personal connection. And I know that they try to do that with the calendars that they do, and, and you know, trying to do spotlights and highlights on the, uh, you know, the different missionaries that that you have. But I mean, let's be honest: nobody knows or cares about any of these random missionaries if they don't know them personally. And I think there's something to be said for a church sponsoring personally missionaries that they know. Um, my first ministry job as a youth minister was at a Bible church, an independent Bible church. And, um, you know, of course, they're not in the Southern Baptist Convention. They're not connected to the cooperative program. Um, but we had uh, three or four, I think it was four, four Wycliffe translator missionaries that, I mean, came out of that church, that attended that church when they were home on sabbatical that we knew personally. Uh, and that made all the difference. It's like, hey, we're not just, you know, giving X amount of dollars to the cooperative program in general to the Southern Baptist Convention. We're giving X amount of dollars to, you know, Mike and Judy over here. We're giving X amount of dollars to Ron and Kate over here. And, you know, we're, we're giving to people who are, we can substantially see the mission that they're doing. Um, and then that ties back into the, like I said, the, the, how do they select missionaries? How do they determine where to send them? They have like list and checklist of statistics that say, Hey, you should be reaching X amount of people in this town with this many dollars and the, and the money and the amounts just keep going up and the conversions and the baptisms just keep going down. And it's just, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into that, but it just, I don't know, honestly, that it works anymore. Maybe it never did, but maybe even if it did before, I don't know that the cooperative program is working properly. I don't think the IMB, I don't think the North American Mission Board are working like they should be working now. Um, and then that beg, that does beg the biggest question, if the Southern Baptist Church doesn't have, or the convention doesn't have the cooperative program, what is the Southern Baptist Convention? Because quite frankly, without the cooperative program, there's no reason to be in the SBC. There really isn't. I mean, why would you want to be in the SBC if it wasn't for the cooperative program? It's literally the one thing that holds us all together. Um, I mean, we have this sort of creedal, well, mock creedal uh, faith statement, the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 revised edition or whatever, but you know, that's sort of a general statement, but even that's not really what holds us together because there's different interpretations and views on how to read some of those statements. And so it's really the cooperative program that holds us together as Baptists. And if that system fails and is failing, why stay? Why not support our own missionaries? Why not put that money into our own communities? Why not focus locally uh, and even focus on sending our own church people abroad and, and to do mission trips and so um, that's kind of where I am right now it's like I want to say you know should we leave the SBC I'm not there yet and I say yet because I have a tendency as I did, as I was talking about at the beginning 
I have a tendency to jump to knee jerk reactions. I'm definitely one of those, you know, do something even if it's wrong kind of guys. You know, I don't, I don't put a whole lot of thought into things sometimes, which is one of my failings. And so I want to make sure that I'm not just reacting um, to emotionalism, to, you know, um, the, the hype and the, the media stuff and the things that are going on. I want to make sure I'm just not reacting to those things. I want to put some logical thought into that and some prayer into that and to consideration into it. And so I'm not to that point yet, but I'll be honest, if things continue to decline, I have to ask all Southern Baptist churches, why are we still in the Southern Baptist Convention? Just focus locally on, your, on reaching your local community and cooperate with the churches in your local area and don't worry about it. Um, and so that's kind of where I am right now. And maybe that'll change. And I, I hope things improve for the Southern Baptist Convention and, and don't continue to decline in various ways. But um, I don't know. We'll see how things go. But that's where we'll leave it for today. And um, if you got any comments, you can comment down there below. And like I said, I, this is all my personal opinion. You know, take it with a grain of salt and it's worth less than two pennies and whatnot. But um, and you're, you may feel more strongly about it than I do. I honestly don't care that much, but uh, that there it is. Um, next week we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to hit on Christmas myths uh, because you, everybody knows the Christmas story, and uh, but they all read it wrong so often. And so we're going to talk about some of those things about hey, how many wise men were there? Did Mary ride a donkey? When did the wise men show up? You know, let's talk about you know. Uh, all those singing angels that the shepherds heard, right? Let's let's talk about all of these things that are really kind of myths that we just kind of, you know, we watch the Charlie Brown version or something and haven't actually read the Bible version closely enough uh, to see the, the differences there. And so we'll, we're going to talk about that next week as we're getting ready for Christmas. Um, and that's going to be the last one for the year. I have to take the next two weeks off anyway as uh, I'll be gone for Christmas break and whatnot, and we'll get back up in the new year. So but we'll end it there, and we'll see you guys next time. Have a good week. <laughs>